Welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul. My co-host Justin Baker is not himself today. I'd say despite having the day off today, despite it being Canada Day, happy Canada Day there, eh? Yeah, eh? Uh, Your Red Wings once again fail to get the first overall pick that they have never had in their illustrious, what, practically 100-year history. Uh, The last time they did have the first overall pick was 1964, before really the draft was was a big deal. So we're just saying they've never had the first overall pick since, you know, there were six teams. Uh, so the floor is yours, my friend. Lament, cry if you need to. Let me know how you're feeling about this. Wow. Yeah, I'm actually not as angry that we didn't get the first overall pick. I'm actually more upset the fact that a team we don't know got the first overall pick. That to me is more upsetting because I think... Steve Eisman put it very, very well coming off the the draft lottery floor or whatever when he got interviewed. He said the odds were more in our favor to not get the first overall pick than they were to actually obtain it. Um, I mean, if you think about it, what? Yeah, it's an 80% chance right. that you're not going to get it, of course. Exactly. So to, to not get the first overall pick is not upsetting. And I mean, I, went, I actually went back, took a look at the last four draft lotteries, um, <clears throat> excuse me, basically since Austin Matthews got picked number one overall. Right. And... Um, to be quite honest, the teams at the top don't necessarily ever... I mean, they've never fallen in order, for one thing. And then two, I mean, it's been a 50% chance that the, the worst team got the number one pick. So, again, you're rolling the dice. It's a 50-50 shot. So, to me, that was not upsetting. What was upsetting is the fact that, again, we have a team that potentially you know, is given a shot at the Stanley Cup, and they could end up... For example, Pittsburgh Penguins. How disgusting would it be if you have Alex Lafreniere sitting next to Sidney Crosby on the line? That's not fair. How are you? You have an NHL fair. that's... Well, yeah, okay. Fair, right? You have an NHL that is striving for balance, but yet you're going to give a team that is a potential Stanley Cup team a shot at the number one pick. And now I understand... 12.5% shot sure. at it, yeah. Now, I understand, you know, every single year the teams that don't make the playoffs have a shot. And, you know, we've seen teams, you know, jump pretty dang high. I think, what, uh, you know, last year Chicago was 20th. They finished 20th. They ended up getting the third pick. The year before that, you had Carolina finish 21st. They got the second overall pick. So we've seen teams jump, and I'm totally okay with it. However, I think my biggest gripe and something I will consistently stress until the NHL finally fixes this stupid draft lottery is – the fact that you're by expanding the playoffs to 24 teams, you're giving teams that wouldn't necessarily have a chance at a cup a better chance at getting a cup. So you're increasing their odds to get the Stanley Cup now at this point. However, the teams to win the draft lottery that didn't make the playoffs, you're not increasing their odds at all. You're just basically saying, oh, you're still the same. Yes, but if you consider the fact that in a normal year, there, I mean, right now we're we're seeing uh, 20, right. a 24-team playoff. So there's eight teams that shouldn't be in there a in a normal year. year. And those eight teams would be eligible for the first overall pick. But it's not a normal year. <laughs> I agree. You throw it out the window. I agree, but you, I don't think that you can... I mean, there, there was a very small chance of one of these playoff teams getting it. <laughs> and it very small. And it happened, and it just kind of... It's so beautifully NHL. But I love it. I think it's awesome. I mean, the fact that, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Not not that I not that I want the Leafs to lose, but if they lose and <laughs> somehow get the first overall pick, it's crazy. I mean, it is crazy. But I, I now there are a few teams where if they do get the first overall pick, it's going to be mayhem. The Pittsburgh Penguins are definitely one. You mentioned that the Toronto Maple Leafs are another one. Uh, I mean. If the New York Rangers, what if the Edmonton uh, Oilers get it? If the Edmonton Oilers get it, it'll be it'll be pretty. What cr- the flip? Yeah, people will be pissed. It, it, it would be another time the Oilers. Yes. Not only, I mean, the thing is, not only did they you have to win this this draft lottery to even have a shot at the next draft lottery, you've got to lose in this round. I, I mean, I think it's pretty unlikely that that'll happen. But I mean, you also have to consider like the Arizona Coyotes are not very good. 
No, I. They're there fine. Are teams, they're they're okay. teams like the Minnesota Wild, Arizona Coyotes. You talked about it. Who could you or Columbus Blue Jackets? The likely they could teams use that will get that will get that pick. Yes, I it, I sure hope so because it'll be bedlam if they don't. It is to me. It's likely that it'll be. I mean, Chicago would be another one if if Chicago gets it. But I actually wouldn't mind Chicago if they were yeah. one of the teams. Yeah. You know, they're they're a big market. I think the NHL would love that. I think the fans would love it, to be quite honest, because I would love to see, I mean, I think, you know, one, Jonathan Taves would be, he'd be fun to watch having, you know, another winger on his line. But I think even, you know, Lafreniere with Patrick Kane would be great, regardless who you throw in at center. I mean, just the possibilities. I I, Honestly, I'll tell you what, my, this is my dream scenario, uh, my dream scenario is the Leafs win the cup always. That's that's always up there with my dream scenarios. Uh, second dream scenario, if they're not going to win the cup, go ahead and lose in this round and, <laughs> and get the first overall pick. But I think what what like my heart says that I want to happen is for the Montreal Canadiens to win this draft lottery. Oh, I've seen a lot of people. Yeah, because like that's the dream Lafreniere scenario. Lafreniere going and staying the hometown, homegrown kid. I mean, it has been a long time since Montreal has had a true French Canadian star, and I I think that that would be really. Cool. I get it, and I like I, even like I, we talked about four years ago with Toronto winning the lottery, I actually was pulling for Arizona because I'm like, this kid, like you need I some excitement in the were. in the I desert. And I know you weren't. <laughs> yeah. I was actually in Vegas at the time. Oh when yeah, that okay. happened. Yeah, that's great. And uh, uh, I didn't put money on it, but I should have. Yeah, should have. Uh, but again, like you look at okay, so like last year, right? Ottawa, worst team in the league. They ended up drafting fourth. Well, technically Colorado did. But uh, L.A. at 30, they draft draft five, New Jersey. Then Detroit, they fell all the way to six. Uh, Buffalo fell all the way, fell to seventh. So, again, and then you look at the years before that, too. You look at most of these teams, you know, in the bottom five of the league. They've drafted usually in the top eight, but they've all fallen at some point. So, again, I'm not so upset that the wings fell again, even though it's funny. I saw a little stat somebody posted on Twitter. It was like the most lost picks by like how many spots you fell back over the last three years. And Detroit, of course, has fallen back the most of any team, which is kind of, I mean, it's it's a gut punch at that point when you look at something like that. Yeah, they, they have not been very lucky. Uh, no. Although the last time they picked fourth overall. Right. Worked out pretty good in 1983, right? Steve Eiserman. I mean, let's let's take a look back at some of the fourth round picks. The fourth overalls. I would love For, to hear. Fourth overalls. Uh, we, I mean, we can go back really far. We can go back as far as, I mean, a nice three-year run. 1980, Larry Murphy, Ron Francis, and then Steve Eiserman. Uh, you had, I mean, you know, there's obviously there's every now and then there's some duds. Uh, the year that the last time the Wings picked this high in the draft was... Uh, 1990, when they picked third overall, and they took Keith Primo, not a bad guy. Uh, unfortunately, they missed out on Yermir Yager, who was taken fifth overall. Uh, 93, Paul Correa, fourth overall. 97, Luongo. Uh, 2001, Stephen Weiss, not a bad fourth overall pick. Uh, Andrew Ladd, no four. Nicholas Backstrom in 06. Petrangelo, 08. Uh, Kane, Evander Kane in 09. Ryan Johansson, you got Seth Jones in 2013. I mean, even even recently, 2018, you've got Brady Kachuk. We the you know the the votes out on Bowen Byram who were taken last year, but actually, I just saw Bowen Byram is joining the Colorado Avalanche for the playoffs. All right. Uh, the year before that, 2017. Cal McCarr. Yeah, not bad. Let's not talk about the year before that, though. <laughs> the the year before, Jesse Poyarvi, uh, I mean, maybe there's a chance he could be halfway decent, but we'll see. Mitch Marner, the year before, at number four. I mean, 2014, uh, Sam Bennett, that's that's probably where it falls off. But, again, I mean, he, you've got a great opportunity for a really nice player. No, I, I don't a disagree. star, like a potential star. Yeah, I, I think when you look at the guys at the top of the draft, right, obviously Alex Lafreniere, he's going to be – He's number one. There's no question about it. And I, hey, the Wings have had some fortune players falling to oh, them sure. later. Yeah. Who Dylan knows, Larkin, what, he fell. Maybe Byfield falls. That, there there are some mock drafts out there that have yeah. him going third or fourth. It, it's so because like Bob McKenzie, Darren Dreger, these, these draft experts, they all have like in terms of tiers, right? They've got Alex Lafreniere up at number one. Then just slightly below him, they've got Byfield and Stutzel. 
like in their own little group and then there's then they slightly fall off a little bit more but it's still good still some really great players well and how often i mean that's that's usually how it is yeah of course not every i mean think the year seth jones was taken fourth overall i mean it was kind of this he might go first overall and then Nathan mckinnon shot way up and i mean you, you're going to get a nice player at four. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. That no matter how you slice it, this pick is going to change the the fortunes of the franchise. Yeah, they could get a... It should. Well, yeah, because <laughs> right now I, I look at it and I think maybe they're probably going to pick a guy like Marco Rossi or maybe Jamie Drysdale on defense who would be a great one-two punch with, you know, Maurice Snyder to go for the next, you know, 10, 15 years on the back end would be fantastic. He's a right-handed guy, which again, don't, they don't come along that often either. And, uh, you know, he is projected to be the top defenseman. So, you know, does Eisenman go that route or do, does he try to get a star up front and a guy like maybe Marco Rossi, who's, you know, a small center at five, nine, but he plays hard. Like, you know, everybody's comparing him to Claude Giroux basically right now is what I keep hearing. And, um, you know, again, like you said, regardless, I think Detroit's going to get themselves a nice player. And there's no doubt in my mind Steve Eisenman's going to do his homework. He's going to find, you know, that diamond in the rough or he's going to find a guy that works for their system because that's that, I think that's what Detroit has always done well. And I think I uh, gosh, I can't remember who it was was talking about Kenny Holland when he just got inducted in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And they were always talking about what he was drafting, you know, what him and Jimmy DeMolano were drafting when they were with the Wings. And it was always guys that fit their system, not necessarily the best player available. And I think, again, maybe that's what we're going to get with Maurice Schneider here because you know Eiserman spent a lot of time under Ken Holland before he went and took over in Tampa. And I think you know a lot of that translated into success for the Wings, so there's no doubt in my mind I think they're still going to maybe go with that same sort of model, that same idea of let's take the guy that works best for what we're trying to build and not necessarily the best guy available. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it also pays off to take a look back at what Eiserman did while he was in Tampa Bay as the GM. Uh, I will say that his first round selections weren't always great. Uh, I mean, the last time he picked this high was in 2013. He picked Jonathan Drouin at three. So he missed out on Seth Jones. Can you imagine? Yeah. It could have been Victor Hedman and Seth Jones on the same blue line. <laughs> he had just made a different pick. But he does, he, I mean, he took Anthony D'Angelo. He ended up being a good, a really nice player, yeah. just not for Tampa. Uh, Cal and Nor- Nolan Foot are uh, kind of the jury's still out with them, but I, I do think that with this pick, he is going to do what he did with um, so many of his later round picks. I mean, there were so many great late round picks for the Tampa Bay Lightning that he was able to build that core around. So I think you're looking at this. You've got basically a can't miss guy at number four, especially the way that they're going to develop these guys. Yeah, and what I would love to see just the wild card because again, you talk about last year with Steve Eisman, right? You had a guy with Maurice Snyder who was probably going to be bottom third of the first round. That's where he was projected to go, and Eisman taking him at six. I mean, we all saw the reaction when he got picked; his jaw dropped, hit the floor. I would love to see Eiserman throw the wild card out there because this has been a, a position that the Wings have been looking for somebody for the future for you know maybe the last five six years and that's at goaltender. You've got the guy from Russia, uh, Eskarov. You who's cannot supposed to take be a, a goaltender. You cannot take a goaltender. Does he? Right does he roll the dice? No way. No way. Not a chance. Not I don't chance. think so either. But I mean, that would be total Steve Eiserman fashion. Be like, this is our I guy. Mean, yeah, I he he he'll probably go in the first round, but it'll be. Like like Spencer Knight last year went at fifteen. That was even a little too high, you know. When you talk about fifteen for a goaltender, that's just not the really player that, that high, you but. can get at fifteen, yeah, it's it's just too it's too risky. I mean, yeah, you could you could definitely hit, and then you're a genius. But how many goalies have made GMs look dumb? Right, what for the drafting last them too early? Last time the Wings drafted a goalie number or in the first round, Thomas McCullum. McCullum, yeah, and that like hasn't worked out very well. Overall or something like that, right? Thirtieth, yeah. Oh, was thirtieth? Yeah. Oh, oh but right. Still right. hasn't Back worked out very well in the cup. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we ca- we have an idea of obviously we we know the rest of the order, uh, the Red Wings notwithstanding, uh, the LA Kings picking at number two. And the Ottawa Senators via the San Jose Sharks, uh, obviously not protected from this this draft lottery. Wouldn't San Jose love to get their which, hands on uh, this, which pick. is unfortunate for them. I mean, the Senators going at three and five. 
I'm wondering, like, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm thinking, all right, what, what kind of, are there any trade possibilities that maybe the senators could do to move up in this, you know, would you, would you as a, let's say the, we'll just go, cry. let's say the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, Man, nobody. I don't. Nobody's gonna pass on the Lafreniere. No, I don't think so. But let's just say, let's say the Penguins are are number one overall, and Ottawa comes to you and says, "We'll give you three and five for one," and like you have to give them your second round pick or something like that. Would you pass on Lafreniere to to get who you could get at three and five? Boy, that's tough because okay. I like to use last year as a good example for something like this because Jack Hughes, a guy who everybody's like, okay, this guy's the number one center. He's obviously the number one pick. There's no doubt. But he didn't. He didn't. You know, he didn't explode last year. He wasn't like you know a 60, 70 point rookie. Right. He just came right. out and he was he was mediocre last year. He looked same like he was still trying Keiko, to get yeah, yeah yeah still trying to get adjusted to the game. And yeah, Capo Caco was the same way. And you know, so I think there's no sure things. And while I think again, Lafreniere a is going to be a stud in this league. There's still no guarantee he's gonna he's gonna be you know a 60 70 point guy next year for whatever team you put him on, especially because he's not at center, right? Sure. So maybe that lessens the value on a guy like that, maybe a little bit more. Although I I, I don't think so. But I mean this, this this draft last year's draft was very weak. I mean, out of everyone taken in that draft, only five players played games. Only three wow. more than eight games. And that is the top three picks, Doc, Kako, and Hughes. And no one had more than 10 goals. No one had more than 23 points. And they all played over 60 games. Uh, it looks like Bowen Byram is going to come in and maybe play in the playoffs here for Colorado. Uh, I, I know there's good pl- there's players who will be good. But usually we see within the you know that first year, there's more players who show up and, and end up making their team's roster some at some point throughout the year. Now, maybe that would have happened. Obviously, the season was shortened, and so uh, there was this, maybe some opportunity. And, and, you know, we do see some younger guys kind of come out March and April. They have some, some great stretches there. Maybe we'll see that come playoff time. We'll see some, some a different look from a guy like Capo Kaiko. I don't know. Uh, but this draft, pretty weak in terms of, like, immediate – NHL ready talent, but the 2020 draft, I th- I think there's there there could be seven or eight guys who actually come in, crack their teams' rosters, and get going. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, I look at a guy like, for example, Tim Stutzel, who I think he's got size, he's got the IQ to do it, and I think he showed at you know the World Championships that he can compete, you know, in the big boy league, and I think you know he would be a guy, especially if I'm, you know considering moving down if you know if I got the number one and I'm eyeing that three and five pick he's a guy that you know is high on my radar in terms of this is why I'm doing it right because I think he's a guy you know more than maybe you know just about anybody else at the top of the draft who I think is going to be able to come in and play and maybe Jamie Drysdale too you could throw him in there but I think those are two guys to me that I'd be eyeballing at three and five right now yeah Ottawa's in a pretty unique position I'm I'm excited it would be pretty epic if they tried to trade up that would Depending be. on who gets that. Now, you know, if you're Columbus or Minnesota, like one of the teams that is more deserving, I'll say. Like if 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 one of the t- – obviously we know some team is going to get upset here in, in this preliminary round. There will be a team at 10, 11, or 12 that move on to the second round. It, it's inevitable. There's six of them. It's going to happen. If one of those teams if, – if one of the – uh, five, six, or sevens wins the draft lottery. Eh, are they super deserving? No, not really. Uh, but if we see, you know, Arizona or Minnesota win win the draft lottery, I think we'd it, it maybe softens the blow a little bit. I think we'll look back on this when the draft is happening. If it's one of those teams, and we'll just go, okay. I mean, it could this could have happened anyways. Uh, technically, it was Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Jets spot that won the draft lottery. Technically. So they maybe they're technically most deserving because it was their <laughs> it was their luck that got them in there. But uh, I mean th- that would be even there. Like I wouldn't be mad about the Winnipeg Jets getting the the first overall pick. No. Um, and I did take a look. I was kind of curious. Uh, the last time the number one overall pick got traded in the NHL uh-huh. that was uh, 2003. The Panthers traded yes. the number one pick. 
for and, for Luongo well, to get Di Pietro. No, no, no. They traded it to the Penguins for the number three pick, a second rounder, and Michael Samuelson, and the Panthers or and the Penguins ended up taking Marc Andre Fleury. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh Di Pietro is like two thousand one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the year before that, two thousand two, the Blue Jackets actually traded up from number three with Florida again. Um, a team that doesn't like number one picks apparently, and uh, they took Rick Nash, of course. Rick Nash, yeah. So I know. forgot that they traded for that pick. Interesting. Imagine if Rick Nash got in Florida, maybe they would have been okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's let's shift gears for her a second. The NHL announced that the Edmonton, the Edmonton and Toronto are going to be our hub cities. Uh, do we know yet if is it going to be the East plays in the West and the West plays in the East? Like. I don't know yet. Or is the, are, I think is they're the still East ironing that out. Because I, I had heard that if it was going to be Vegas and Toronto, that they were just going to have the West play in Vegas because it seemed more like everyone's a little closer. But uh, yeah, if if Toronto and Edmonton get that home ice advantage, I can definitely see some people being a little, a little crusty about it, especially the Oilers. For Toronto, I feel like, Home home ice isn't always an advantage in Toronto because everyone's from the area. Like it's an easy place to get to for all the the Canadian players that, that live there. I know that sounds like a Don Cherry thing to say that the <laughs> you know everyone plays their best games in Toronto because their families come and watch them play. Uh, take Don that for Cherry. what it's worth. But oh, sorry, we're not supposed to say his name anymore. <laughs> he, well, I mean, let's face he's it, blacklisted. Oh goodness, there's going to be. No, I mean, there's no fans here, so I'm not really too worried about. That's now, true. The yeah. one advantage you're going to, and I think this is why you might end up seeing East teams playing in Edmonton and West teams playing in Toronto, is because, you know, they've, and, and again, they might work this out in some sort of detailed, um, you know, with, I, I think right now they're trying to negotiate an extended CBA and all those other details before they move on to the next yeah. phase. But, um, you know, there's going to be other, you know, other teams that are going to cry foul because Toronto can you know, essentially probably go home to their families in Toronto, right? Well, I don't think they're going to let them. Okay, so that's, yeah, yeah that's... Yeah. They're going to do, like, some kind of Olympic village thing. Right. That's kind of what I figured was going to happen, and obviously Edmonton Because they have, they have to quarantine, like, they right. have to be... Totally have to be quarantined. ...quarantined from the outside. Now, I, I, I think the reason why, ultimately, the East will play in Toronto and the West will play in Edmonton is because of the time. Sure. Like, you, you want your fans to see the games. Yep, yeah. exactly. And it makes sense. Um, you I know, mean, it's going to be weird that like there's going to be, I mean, in Toronto, they'll use both Rico and, uh, and, uh, what a Rogers center now. Right. So you've got those two arenas. I don't know if they'll use some OHL. They probably will use some OHL teams. Uh, and I guess it'll be like these two teams play at this rink. These two teams play at this rink and they're going to play all their games at the same rink is my guess how it'll go. But you you also have to. I mean, there's also the whole setup for the TV. Man, some of those if they play in some of those OHL arenas, they are going to have a sick setup when the NHL leaves <laughs> because right. they're going to probably have to add in some additional some nice locker rooms, additional and, hardware, like yeah. to, in locker rooms for the training the staff, camera, like being able to, to put put the game on TV not just in two different angles. Yeah, one from the one side, one from the other. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine they're probably going to try to stick most of their games though in those AHL and NHL stadiums. Yeah, I just think of the the OHL ones where they're you know they they have the uh, I I know for the Plymouth Whalers when they were there now it's Team USA mm-hmm. uh, they have their little suites and then on top of the suites is where the broadcasters sit like just <laughs> in like this open it's like sitting on top of a roof basically watching a game. <laughs> So that's where, you know, Doc Emmerich or something's going to have to be sitting this up there. <laughs> I I don't know. Actually, I heard that they were doing play-by-play from a video. Really? Like they're going to have the camera guys there and they're going to have play-by-play guys in a studio or something watching it and then they're going to call the game like that. I'm sure. That, which is how they did in the Olympics. Yeah, I'm sure the studios are going to try to save every dollar they can at this point. Yeah. So... <laughs> They need to make some money now. Because I, I, I can imagine from a broadcaster standpoint, right, obviously it's it's a little easier to go tell a cameraman who, you know, has no clout, no no pull over, you know, their their fame or whatever, and say seniority like, oh, no, I don't want to go spend two months at this city, right, away from my family. Yeah, true. The, the studio guys probably won't want to do that, so it's easier for them to just be at home or, you know, go into the studio here for a day and then go back home right. to their families. Right. Um, well, shoot. 
the draft lottery is over. Yeah. We know where we're going to play in the next round. We just don't know when. You know what's going to be interesting? <laughs> I They haven't worked out the details yet about specifically when the draft is going to take place. And it made me think, you know, today, candidate, right? We're, we're normally used to seeing hundreds of millions of dollars handed out in contracts to all these free agents. Well, we don't even know when the free agency is going to start, right? Right. Or, they did They did vote to extend right. the free agency. And, but players are still going to get their bonuses for the next year. I think it's three hundred million dollars, something yeah, like that. Three hundred million dollars <laughs> going out today, yeah, uh, so. for for absolutely nothing. So hey, why not? I mean, for the players, I get it. I mean, at this point, you aren't going to get paid for anything because it's the playoffs. Now there are there are, there are players who get bonuses, like if you win the cup or if you win a round. I, I wonder how that's going to work though for a round. Like, does this count as a round? I wouldn't think the plan does count they, as a round. They might, they might have it in their contract where it says, you know, if you make it to the second round, you get a, you know, a, a fifty thousand dollar bonus or something, or a five hundred thousand dollar bonus, whatever it may be. Be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think you're also other thing you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of players coming out saying I'm stronger than I've ever been. You're starting to get this off season talk like oh, I've been, I've, I've been working and I'm I'm ready to go. I'm faster. I'm stronger. Uh, uh, Quinn Hughes stronger than he's ever been. I just saw he also said that, or uh, who was it? Somebody talking about Jack Eichel saying that this is. Oh no, no, it was Quinn Hughes talking about Jack Hughes saying like this is the best thing that that could have happened to him because he had, he won't he'll have a nine month break like all these guys who didn't make the playoffs they got a nine month break. Yeah, that's not too shabby. That all assumes that we start when we like kind of assume in December. Yeah, January whenever. Yeah. So I mean it's. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, I I know the league desperately wants and needs this to happen, uh, so they're they're going to go full bore. I know there also is an opt out if a player doesn't feel comfortable, he can just opt out of playing for the rest of the year, uh, which be interesting to see who decides to do that. Like, yeah, I could see like third or fourth liners doing that. Oh but. no, I I mean Artemi Panarin has talked about like saying that he doesn't feel safe. Carey Price has said the same thing. We'll we'll see. I the, it's yeah. usually not just some third line guy. Like yeah, but how did like how does that sit with the, the guys in the locker room who are showing up? Right. Hey, you know. Yeah. Do you yeah. put that if that guy opts out? Do you put his name on the cup still? Right. If like for instance, for say there's in some certain, fluke world, right, yeah. the Rangers win the cup without Panarin. <laughs> Do not you put gonna that guy's, happen. <laughs> not gonna exactly, but do you put that guy's name on the cup? Do you give him a Stanley Cup ring? You know, it's like there there are some stipulations to whose name goes on the cup. Right. Yeah. Like how many games you have to have played or something. Yeah, like. and you have to. You know, you you could have played just one game in the finals, and your name automatically gets on. Yeah, and then your yeah. team can petition. There's all these wild things that yeah. they can do, but yeah. still, be right. interesting. Well. Uh, anything else before we uh, before we wrap it up today? Our our next show, we we had to jump in and and talk about the draft lottery, obviously. Uh, but our next show, we will jump back into completing our playoff preview. This time with the top four teams in the Western Conference: the Washington Capitals, Tampa Bay Lightning, the Boston Bruins, and of course the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, but until then, is there anything you want to leave people with? Any final thoughts on the the Red Wings once again getting slighted? No, I. Uh, <laughs> it's I'm not again. I'm not. Should the NHL do away with the uh, with the lottery and just go purely based off the standings? I would prefer that to be quite honest, because again, I think the number of coaches that I've I've seen you know interviews with and people have talked to GMs and it's at no point do these these teams tank you're telling me that the arizona coyotes and buffalo sabers weren't tanking what was it like three or four years ago when they were going for austin matthews <laughs> or no no they were going for Connor mcdavid right remember that that was buffalo and arizona had the best chance at it and that's when the oilers won it arizona dropped to three and they took dylan strome whoops and the leafs at four took mitch martin whoops yeah i you know what it's funny because i think at some point you they know, definitely you, were tanking. Well, so here's the thing. I, I do. The NFL while, tanks too. Well, yeah, they definitely, teams, they definitely tank. I mean, once they've, they've, once they've lost like seven games and they're like two and, you know, two and nine, they're like, okay, yeah, we're tanking the rest of the yeah, year. There's so, no doubt about so it. They definitely do that in the NHL. Anyone that tells I, you that they're like now a GM, they'll go, okay, well, hey, we're, you know, we're not trying to tank. We're, we're, we're trying to win. But when you trade away everyone that's reasonable <laughs> on your roster, 
You sure, are not that, trying to win. That plays a part of it, and I do think there's going to be you know an instance where you actually have a team that legitimately you know this is obvious they're tanking, right? So I I, I wouldn't mind the draft lottery just being like a little bit more heavy favored towards the guys at the bottom, but still give other teams. You know, I would like to see their odds increased a little bit more. I well, think. and I think that the NHL went to this method when the NBA did, right? Because remember the NBA wasn't it like the the Cleveland Cavaliers were the tank for LeBron the last no 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 no, no. Bef- but before like when when this kind of this method kind of exploded it was that I think the Cavaliers were like the best of the worst like they were 14th or 15th or whatever in the rankings sure and they won the draft lottery and picked first overall. And that was, you know, that's the first time I remember going, holy smokes, like this thing is, seems a little lopsided. Right. I I don't disagree. It used to be that the most you could move up was like three picks or four picks or something like that. Yeah, and I would love it if they they throw some rules in like that, for sure. I wouldn't mind if you had, there there may be a better way to do it. Uh, I wouldn't mind if it was like, yeah, one through... I mean, how many, how many teams miss the play? I mean, it's about to be 16 teams miss 15. the playoffs. Half yeah, it'll the team, be 16. Half so. the teams are going to miss the playoffs. So, you know, out of the out of maybe the top four, one of those teams should get the number one. Should get the uh, yeah, but then yeah, maybe maybe out of like the top eight can get the number one, and then the next eight, then it opens it up to everybody. Like the number one maybe should be a smaller group of teams. You draft just with those four teams for the number one. Then and maybe the, the yeah. number two you draft with like the next four or yeah, whatever. Like you can't win the number one overall pick if you weren't like the eighth worst team in the league. Okay. And yeah. then after that you open up the other two, two, three. I, I think it'd be like if you were going to do that, you could just open it up two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just have the whole have the whole thing be a freaking lottery. Have it be crazy. Yeah, there, there would be <laughs> move up and down everywhere. <laughs> yeah, or I, have or have a lottery, the eight teams, and those eight teams are all like they're they're given you know obviously the worst team in the league is given the best odds out of those eight teams, and you you know you have your formula there. Those eight teams can go anywhere one to eight. There you go. Then you've got your next eight. Those eight teams can go anywhere in the eight. I would be okay with that. I like so, that. something something along those lines. Now, the the downside is that does mean that the worst team in the league could end up with the eighth overall pick. Right. Instead. <laughs> so of course you're you know you're you put in rules maybe where they can't fall more than three spots or something you know. Yeah, but then well that's basically all how it is already. But but then you sort of know that yeah I don't know I, yeah there's, there's a, a lot of there's, there's a lot of be a better potentials. Way. Uh, I, I really, honestly, I don't mind at all what happened. I think it's amazing that it happened. It's giving us a whole it's show. It's going to be so fun <laughs> to see what ha- Like, It gives the whole first round, the pre- preliminary round, excuse me, it gives it so much extra meaning. Like It does. Everyone, you know, hey, this team is down 2-0. Wow, they're going to be the first team up for the first overall pick. Like, not that anyone's actually playing for it. Like, anyone who's on the roster, they don't. They don't care. They're not thinking. I really, I, I wouldn't think that, you know, if you're on the Arizona Coyotes and you're Phil Kessel, you're like, oh, we got a tank so we can get Lafreniere. <laughs> so we have a 12.5% chance at Lafreniere. No. You're trying to win a cup. There's a chance. I mean, everything is up in the air right now. So you're, you're trying your best to, to do that, but not a bad consolation prize. I would say so. <laughs> Not a bad consolation <laughs> prize. All right, that's our show. You can find us on Twitter at OT Hockey Talk. Let us know your thoughts on the draft lottery. And uh, as things continue to play out, the NHL moves ever so closer to their camps opening up in nine days from now. Uh, we will keep you abreast to all things going on in the NHL training camps. Until then, happy Canada Day. And we'll talk to you guys soon.